You're innocent until proven guilty. That is, your life, liberty, property cannot be taken from you unless you're convicted of a crime. Now, that's not entirely a myth. Still largely true when it comes to your life and liberty. But your property? If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, forget about it. Ever gone to a police auction or one of those government surplus auctions? We consumer reporters always tell people correctly that these are great places to find a bargain. Plenty of good deals here. People can buy bikes for $10, cars for less than $500. From flat screen TVs to Rolex watches to over 20 boats, you name it, they've got it. But where did they get it? Some is abandoned property, or property taken from someone convicted of a crime. But some of it I would just call loot that the cops grab. Take the Chevy Silverado that used to belong to Zahir El Ali. Ali's repaired houses and cars in Houston for 30 years. He fixes them up and then sells them. But then he sold a truck like that one to a man on credit. Ali held the title to the car until he was paid, but he never was paid in full because the buyer drove drunk and then got arrested. The cops then seized Ali's truck and kept it. They planned to sell it. Ali can't believe it. Look, I own the truck. The truck done nothing. This is my money. Why are you taking my money? The police say it's their right under the forfeiture law because the person driving the car that day broke the law. I have never seen a truck drink and drive every day. I mean, it drink gasoline and that's about it. But it will not drive until I drive it. Uh, I don't think it's the fault of the truck. And they know better. I wouldn't think it's the fault of the truck. Here, here to explain how this works is Ali's lawyer, Scott Bullock. He's with the Institute for Justice. Also from Reason Magazine is Radley Balco. So why they, why isn't it his truck? Somebody drove drunk. He didn't. That's exactly right. It should, it should be his truck. It is his truck, but under this bizarre legal fiction called civil forfeiture, the government can take your property, including your home, your car, your cash, regardless of whether or not you are convicted of a crime. It's led to horrible abuses, like the abuse in Houston, where you have a wholly innocent property owner swept up in these forfeiture proceedings. And it almost sounds like a gimmick where the authorities get to grab stuff. Well, yes, and the, one of the main reasons why they do this and why they love civil forfeiture is because in Texas and over 40 states and at the federal level, police and prosecutors get to keep all or most of the property that they seize for their own use. So they can use it to improve their offices, buy better equipment. In some states like Texas, even pay their own salaries with this forfeited property. Which gives them a big temptation to take stuff. Your, your law firm has made this cartoon that tries to explain how this system works. Let's just take a look at that. If police suspect that you committed a crime, they can arrest you and put you on trial. At that trial, prosecutors must prove you are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But if police suspect your car was involved in a crime, they can take it, sell it, and in most places, pocket the proceeds to pad their budgets. They need not prove you committed any crime. With civil forfeiture, your property is guilty until you prove it innocent to get it back. Carrying too much cash? Police can accuse you of selling drugs or laundering money and seize it. No seize conviction. it without ever taking you to court. And police departments around the country have discovered this is a really good way to raise money. In 1986, the Justice Department's forfeiture fund took in $94 million. Now, it has more than a billion. So with budget cuts coming, this must be very tempting for the police. Well, there, it is tempting, and there are uh, lots of uh, crazy stories about what they do with this money uh, when they have it. Uh, there's a, a district attorney's office in Texas, for example, that used forfeiture money uh, to buy an office margarita machine uh, that won first place at a county fair in a margarita competition. Uh, there's another district attorney in, in uh, Texas who used forfeiture money to take a, a junket to uh, Hawaii for a conference on asset forfeiture and I understand that he was asked how could you possibly do this and he said <laughs> his response was well a judge signed off on it so it's okay uh, they found out later that the judge that signed off on it actually went with him on the uh, junket to Hawaii <laughs> and where's the public outrage 
Well, the public, uh, when they learn about civil forfeiture, is outraged about it. People in this country should not lose their property without being convicted of a crime. And we certainly should not have this perverse incentive system in place for police and prosecutors. If police suspect that you committed a crime, they can arrest you and put you on trial. At that trial, prosecutors must prove you are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But if police suspect your car was involved in a crime, they can take it, sell it, and in most places, pocket the proceeds to pad their budgets. They need not prove you committed any crime or even arrest you to take your property away. Welcome to the upside down world of civil asset forfeiture. With civil forfeiture, your property is guilty until you prove it innocent to get it back. And because most state and federal laws allow police and prosecutors to pocket the proceeds, they have a big incentive to pursue profits, not justice. How big? In 1986, the Justice Department's forfeiture fund took in $94 million. Now, it has more than a billion. State and local agencies receive forfeiture funds too. But we don't know how much because most states don't publicly report on forfeiture. No surprise, abuse is rampant. One New York Police Department spent forfeiture funds on food, gifts, and entertainment. In Georgia, forfeiture funds paid for football tickets for a DA's office. And a DA in Texas used forfeiture dollars to buy TV ads for his re-election campaign. Meanwhile, citizens are seeing cash, cars, and other property taken away for the flimsiest of reasons. Carrying too much cash? Police can accuse you of selling drugs or laundering money and seize it. No conviction or even arrest required. An Institute for Justice study grades state laws on how well they protect people from wrongful forfeitures. Only three states receive a B or better. The rest range from mediocre to awful. And so does federal law. Worse, a federal legal loophole allows police and prosecutors to bypass state protections and keep pocketing forfeiture money. IJ's research shows that the easier and more profitable these laws make forfeiture, the more it is used and abused. It's time to end civil forfeiture. People shouldn't have their property taken away without being convicted of a crime. And law enforcement shouldn't be policing for profit. And this is your property. I mean, this, is, this is stuff they have sold, your property they've sold and put it in their own pocket. To give an idea how much money we're talking about, in 1986, the Justice Department Forfeiture Fund took in $94 million. Now it has more than a billion. Joining me now is attorney Scott Bullock. He is from the Institute for Justice. I didn't know anything about this, Scott. Uh, I, I imagine most folks out there are the same. How did you find out about it? Well, you're absolutely right. A lot of Americans aren't aware of this, uh, but when they find out about it and people were contacting us who had lost their property, were outraged about it, and that's how we got involved. But when people learn about this, that the government can take your property regardless of whether or not you've been convicted of a crime or even arrested for a crime, people are outraged about it. And civil forfeiture is really one of the most serious assaults on private property rights in the nation today. Isn't, isn't there something unconstitutional? I mean, we have property rights guaranteed by, in the Constitution. It's almost an extension of our persons. And to, to take that away before you've established whether it was, it was used in, in the committing of a crime seems to be, to, uh, you know, you're guilty until proven innocent. That's exactly right. Uh, civil forfeiture turns a fundamental American principle that you are innocent until proven guilty on its head. In civil forfeiture, your property is guilty until you prove it innocent. And because this is not a criminal proceeding, it's a civil proceeding, the burden is on you to try to get your property back, and the standards are much lower. And also because it's a civil proceeding, most constitutional protections that are afforded to criminal defendants do not apply to civil forfeiture. Sure. So it is really an abused system. It's, it, and it is similar to eminent domain, isn't it? It's, it's the same kind of thing where the state has the authority to come in, grab what it wants uh, without having to prove its case. 
Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's part and parcel of this attitude that property rights are somehow second-class relations in, yeah. in relationship to other constitutional uh, rights, and it's one of the reasons why police and prosecutors are able to abuse this power. It has to stop. We are starting a campaign to raise public awareness of this, file cases to try to challenge uh, these unconstitutional seizures of property. By the way, just one case in particular, there's this guy named El Ali, who uh, I guess he's uh, where in Detroit or someplace. He, he buys old properties, fixes them up, whether, whether it's houses or cars, and a couple of his cars, or at least one of them, was confiscated this way, right? So it, it could drive him out of business. That's exactly right. He's in Houston, Texas. Houston. Uh, he's our client. Uh, yeah, and, and he is an immigrant success story. He came to this country from his native Jordan, worked his way up, and he sold a car to somebody. The person was paying him on credit. Uh, the person hadn't paid off the property yet. Uh, he gets a DUI. The state of Texas seizes the car for forfeiture, and now Mr. Ali has to try to get his property back. He obviously didn't do anything wrong. It's still his car. And to show you the absurdity of these laws, the name of the case in Texas is State of Texas versus 1-2004 Chevrolet Silverado. <laughs> Oh my the goodness. action is against the property. The property has somehow committed a crime, and then the yes. owner of the property has the burden to try to get it uh, right. back. These laws are very much abused, and they have to stop. And in particular, yeah. in Texas and in many other states, police and prosecutors get to keep the property that they seize oh, for nice. forfeiture. Uh, yeah, which puts it in a direct, uh, gives them a direct <laughs> conflict of interest and mm -hmm. allows them to uh, pursue uh, property and profit. Yes. Justice. Boy, oh boy. You add that to their pension funds, and it might not be a bad job to get Scott Bullock. Good to see you, Scott. The company was founded by three businessmen based upon the premise of why can't prisons operate more like a business? If you provide a good service, if you're consistent with your service, then you can actually operate an institution and make a profit at the same time. So you could actually change the length of the sentence of the child but from his behavior within the facility as assessed by the guard who was probably beating him up. So you keep him longer, make more money. One doctor reported finding eight perforated eardrums in a single day. Um, and the kids got perforated eardrums from the guards slapping them on the side of their head so hard that it burst their eardrums. The idea of private prisons in some sense isn't a new one. In many ways it goes back to the old contract labor schemes developed uh, largely in southern states after the Civil War, the old Confederacy. There was another form of slavery. And all of these numbers represent Prisons. Because as I think anybody will tell you, it's a growing marketplace. Do you suffer from fear of losing your election? Are you terrified that voters will discover you've done nothing to improve their lives? Maybe it's time you talk to your spin doctor about Incarcerex. In clinical trials, Incarcerex has been shown effective at reducing election-related anxieties by making voters think you're doing something about the drug problem. It's simplistic and fast-acting. If your problems continue or get worse, you can always double or triple your dose of Incarcerex. Whether it's addiction, therapeutic use, or just casual use, there's an Incarcerex plan for every American. Best of all, taxpayers, not you, will foot the bill. So talk to your spin doctor about Incarcerex today. Common side effects include loss of civil liberties, police corruption, racial injustice, increased terrorism, spread of HIV and AIDS, and violent crime. Bloated prisons are also a common side effect. Stop taking Incarcerex if bloating lasts longer than 20 years. If you're trying to balance the budget, keep families together, or protect human rights, Incarcerex may not be right for you. Do not mix Incarcerex with the Constitution or common sense. So start taking Incarcerex and keep pretending you're doing something about the drug problem. It's not about justice, it's not about agenda. 
It's not about mobilizing people. It's about dialing for corporate dollars. These two parties have sold the U.S. government and the American people to the highest bidders. 